Boardroom Bound, episode 162, Developing a Successful Reputation Transitioning from the Military to the Boardroom, with Herman Bowles. You need to be a continuous learner uh, to be on a board. So from that perspective, looking at, you know, what can I learn? Because you want to have that opportunity to be a learner and how can I learn from those people on the board? Then the next thing you really want to look at, right? You don't want to just be a sponge soaking up. You also want to give. Then you ask yourself, what is it that I can give to this? And how can I make this a mutual connection where I'm receiving and I'm giving? Hello, and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry, and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give aspiring and existing directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. Quick reminder, you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. And in today's episode, we're speaking with Colonel Herman Bowles. Colonel Herman Bowles started out with a dozen years successful track record in the Army and transitioned over into civilian life and now has an unbelievable portfolio of board roles. Some big public company boards where he is chair, vice chair, board member of so many organizations, including leading nonprofits as well. He's going to pull back the curtain, reveal how those came about and the lessons that we can all take forward in order to find the right board opportunities for ourselves. Before we jump into today's show, I'd like to share a message from our sponsor about director certification. Want to join your first board, or are you looking for additional board seat opportunities? In either scenario, be sure to be disciplined in your approach. Now through the Becoming an Exceptional Board Director Candidate Coaching and Certification course, you get both modern board director candidate packaging and modern board operations knowledge integrated within one program. Remember, the key to landing additional or your first board seat is in your packaging. Make the effort to do it right. Program graduates also receive their globally recognized International Board Director Competency designation upon course completion. It's designed for individuals and groups. You can learn more at bit.ly slash IBDC D. That's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash IBC D. And now let's jump into the show. Herman Bowles, welcome to the Boardroom Bound podcast. Alexander, it's great to be here. Well, it is it is my honor as someone who has a long history in my family of military service. Herman, thank you. I should say, Colonel Bowles, thank you for your service. And I am delighted to share in some ways your story today, going from being successful in the military to being incredibly successful in the boardroom. But of course, this is February when we're airing this episode. And I'm very excited also to be able to talk about some of the barriers that you have broken in your career and done it in such an impressive fashion. So I get very excited. I want to jump right into those parts. But we need to start by ever, everyone understanding, let's say, like the first part of your career story, the, the military start and maybe begins at West Point. So how did your career arc start and then we'll transition to the business world? Well, you know what? I think West Point is certainly a good start for that, but I think probably many of the things that I've done go back to my childhood. Uh, I'm the youngest of six children. Uh, my mom, uh, unfortunately, had me when my dad was killed in a farm accident. So there she was, pregnant with uh, me, six other kids, ranging in ages from, uh, you know, not born to 14. And at that point, she had not even gone to college, uh, fin- hadn't finished high school for that matter. So she had been a domestic and a cook, and she kept the family together for for, for many years. And uh, I think what was important, when I was probably second or third grade, she went back and got her GED. Hmm. Uh, for high school, and then went on to college to become a licensed practical nurse, which propelled us in Alabama, by the way, I'm from Florence, Alabama, uh, propelled us into a, a middle-class um, existence. Uh, and I remember seventh grade, we moved into town, and here I was, the new kid, little skinny kid on the block, and somehow I, through sports, integrated into the uh, community of, quote-unquote, the cool kids. And fortunately, I had a uh, good grade and went through high school and ended up being quarterback of the football team, National Honor Society. And I was also president of student council and several other things went with that. I also had the opportunity to have the record and the high jump the track, played baseball and basketball as well. So it was very, very active. So that sets up West Point. 
And by, by the way, that thinking, sounds like a typical West Point cadet, huge overachiever. <laughs> well, uh, I, I did some admissions work, let me tell you, uh, at West Point, and I would not want to compete with these kids today because they continue to get better. But, but anyway, for me, Alexander, that was part of the uh, decision process. You're 17 year old, years old, and people are telling you how successful you're going to be. And let me tell you, that's a lonely place to be because you just don't know what to base it on. But in this instance, uh, being recruited uh, for, for football by a few schools, and as I looked at everything, West Point seemed like the best challenge for me, and I chose to take West Point. And then from there, you went on to about a dozen years, uh, rising up to the rank of colonel, right? That is correct. So uh, West Point was a great experience. It is probably one of the best leadership laboratories in the world, where you go in as a plebe or freshman, and you've been big man on campus or big woman on campus, and none of that matters. Your hair is cut, your clothes are exactly the same, and it's just a matter of your in a true meritocracy making your way. So at graduation, I went into the Army. Uh, I did spend 11 and a half years in the Army, and I'm proud to say I met my wife, uh, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year. Uh, from cancer. I met her on my first assignment, and she was just a remarkable lady, and we had the opportunity to build a great family. Um, after at Fort Dix, we went on a joint assignment to Korea, and after Korea, well, she had a, a great career, as I said. We went to graduate school in Boston. She was at Tufts while I went to Harvard to get an MBA, and after that, we both went back to West Point, where she worked in the admissions office, as an admissions officer, and uh, I taught finance and economics at West Point uh, for a few years. And after that, we went to the Pentagon. Uh, I went to the Pentagon, and she was in 1988, and she worked on the Presidential Inaugural Committee um, here in Washington. And then uh, in 1989, uh, we both left active duty, and that's when I started my business career. While, while remaining in the reserves, and again, I stayed in the reserves uh, actually until 2008, uh, obtaining the rank of colonel, and I spent the majority of that time teaching at West Point. Now, you had a second act, and I'll call it that, because I think there's a not a full appreciation by everybody in the business world what we just talked about. Some of the best leaders I've ever met have come out of the military, and we need their expertise, their background, their gung-ho, their going-to-get-it attitude, and they really help businesses. For some people, that might be a bit more of a challenge than others. I've heard some people leaving the military, like, got to learn a whole new set of lingo, a whole new set of acronyms to, to, be, to be successful in it. So talk us through, perhaps as you came out, I'm guessing boards may not have been on your career trajectory at that point, but where did, where did the point happen that after you left the military, you're in the business world, that the first board stuff came about as something, this is what I want to do, and how'd you go get it? Yeah, well, I, I have, uh, Alexander, as I give speeches, I have one thing that I talk about, particularly if I'm talking to college or early career individuals, and that is if you hang with the dogs, you get fleas. If you soar, you're with the eagles. And by that soaring, what I did at a very early age, I remember when we were in Korea, we have a, a book at West Point called The uh, uh, Assembly of Graduates. And it basically has every graduate that has ever graduated from West Point. And I actually read that book, <laughs> okay? I, I looked at it, and I saw a common trend between people that had become CEOs, you know, executives, board members, et cetera, et cetera. And I wasn't – I certainly knew I wanted to be successful, and I didn't know exactly what that meant. And one of the things that I saw is that a lot of people, uh, even through my uh, general reading, I saw that they associated themselves with their university and college. And what I did um, – was volunteered to work on the Association of Graduates at West Point. I was not a member of the board. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm a vice chair-elect of that organization. That'll actually, when this airs, I'll be vice chair. Uh, however, what I found out is that one uh, can volunteer to get involved in this. And this was back in the, uh, in the 90s. Computers were just out. And one individual that was chair of the, we called it Business and Finance Committee, his name was Bill Murdy. He had actually taught in the Department of Social Sciences where I taught uh, finance and economics, and he was also a Harvard Business School graduate. And uh, Bill was working on things. I would volunteer to do spreadsheets and this type of thing. And again, you can be on a committee of the board without being on the board. And, you know, probably about three, 
four or five years – actually, it was about ten years later because uh, I stayed in contact with Bill. Uh, Bill gave me a call and said, uh, hey, I'm going to be CEO of another public company, and I want somebody that has kind of a real estate background because when I left active duty from uh, the Army, I went to what was at the time LaFalle Partners, which is now JLL or Jones Lang LaFalle, and had established a um, – uh, you know, career in starting in development and asset management and in real estate. And Bill was rounding out the board and thought he wanted someone with a real estate background. And that is really, and this was before Sarbanes-Oxley, these were the days when you could, uh, you know, basically have a lunch with somebody and uh, get on the board. Matter of fact, I had lunch with Bill as well as the founder of the company. And uh, kind of the two of them, uh, they said, hey, I think we like you enough to be on the board. And I met the other board members when I came to the first board meeting. And, of course, that would never happen today, but that was back in 1999-2000. Uh, in so that's the way the first board meeting came, uh, board position came about. And there's a consistent theme, I think, throughout that. And it's, number one, having a phenomenally positive reputation. And then number two, um, having a strong network that comes as a result of your connecting with uh, with a lot of people. You know, you just summarized that very well, because I was going to say, uh, one of the things that I think people struggle with when I hear from them early on thinking, I want to be on a board, you're not just looking for any board seat, you're looking for the right board seat where you bring the expertise and the background. They're not just looking for any warm body, they're looking for a very specific person. You were, like you just said very briefly, real estate expert. They needed that expertise, but also trusted, valued member of their network. And they, they clearly knew themselves. You would be a cultural fit. You would bring this value and experience between them. Now, you've been on so many boards since then. If you were to go back, Herman, and look at that yourself now, knowing you know how to do due diligence to figure out whether a board seat is open to you today, would you have gone about that differently? You talked about you didn't meet the other board members till you walked into the room. I, I would, uh, based on what I know now, I would definitely uh, do that differently. However, everybody out there that's going for that first board, uh, there, there are a whole bunch of things about that company at the time. Um, the company had been a roll-up, meaning that they had used a lot of finance to um, basically uh, centralize the HVAC mechanical contracting industry. And as a result of that, they used uh, debt and their stock as currency to go out and assemble all of these companies. And you might remember about that time, uh, you know, in four and five, 2004 and five, you know, we also ran into uh, an economic uh, challenge as well. And as, you know, when I went on the board, the stock was probably around five. It went down to three. And, uh, you know, we had $700 million in debt. <laughs> and we're in a recession. And, boy, it looks like you made a really sound decision there, Bulls. And the question there is, I did make a sound decision because that stock, probably I didn't look at it today. Uh, but, uh, you know, it probably it's, it's around 100, uh, having been down at two. Uh, the, the, the company has just done fantastic. But to get back to your question, this is the way I decide. Matter of fact, I, I'm not going to mention the company, but I got a call today asking to be on another board, which I uh, turned down, and I've turned down several boards over my career for a lot of reasons. And this is the way I look at board service. The first thing, is the company something that I can really get excited about? You know, is it something that I have a, a, just an innate interest in and I want to get to know that company and, and, and or industry? The second thing I do is look at the people that are on the board. Remember what I said earlier? You become an extension of the people that you hang out with. So if you told me you were on the Enron board and, you know, you hung around with some people that kind of, you know, went to sleep at the switch. So that's probably not a good thing. I doubt if any of those people ever got on another board. But uh, it's important for you to understand who is it that you're getting in the boat with, so to speak. And then the next thing is you – Think, I think you need curiosity, and that means you need to be a continuous learner uh, to be on a board and, uh, or to just be a good executive or a good human being. Uh, so from that perspective, looking at you know, what can I learn because you want to have that opportunity to be a learner and how can I learn from those people on the board. Then the next thing you really want to look at, right, you don't want to just be a sponge soaking up. You also want to give. Then you ask yourself, what is it that I can give to this, and how can I make this a mutual connection where I'm receiving and I'm giving? 
didn't have any ability to do that. And then, uh, you know, later in my career, it got to the point that uh, the next thing you got to do is you got to look at the board schedule and make sure that it is, uh, you know, compatible with either what you're doing on your day job and your company and or other boards. And I've had some that have passed all of those hurdles and then the schedule, uh, you know, the, the board meeting up tempo doesn't work. So to, to get it all and the boards I'm doing now, it's somewhat of a miracle there. Probably over the next two years, I think I may have one or two uh, conflicts uh, being on four public company boards, and that's uh, uh, actually miraculous. Well, I'm sure you're constantly whispering in the secretary's ears as they start to think about future schedules of like, try not to try to avoid these dates. Well, well, you, you've uh, you, you've met my assistant, Pat, putting this yeah. together, and she, she's been with me, and that's another thing that I'm very fortunate she and I've worked together for over 21 years, and she has a knack for knowing, you know, what can and can't happen. And uh, uh, so, you know, having that support mechanism, and I got to tell you, the other support mechanism over the years uh, was my uh, was my wife, uh, Iris. And uh, you know, I would you know be able to talk to her. For example, I had two opportunities that I was uh, offered to be on a tobacco company board, uh, for example. And at the time, I was on a uh, a VA Department of Veterans Affairs advisory board advising the secretary, and I'm like, you know, what? And you know, you go to a hospital and you see kids, uh, you know, with lung cancer, and then you come out and say that you're on a on, on a tobacco board. And I just, I, you know, that philosophically did not agree with me, and uh, that's not one that I pursued. All right, so Herman, we've talked through the story about how you've successfully been on your first board, and I'm guessing probably scratched a little bit of an itch. You got excited about it. There's a bit of a transition period here because you have this amazing portfolio now. So let's talk about how the the second opportunity came about, which is USA, and and you and I have talked before. It's an organization near and dear to my heart, lifelong member, love that organization. Um, How did that come about? And for people who don't know USA, this is if you're watching, say, the the West Point uh, Navy game, right? That you're going to see a lot of ads. They typically target the military family, and you would probably think if you looked at the board, you know you're going to have a four-star from every one of the services, right? There's going to be one of that sort of leadership there. How did the USA board come about, Herman? That one came about, again, through relationships. When I told you I left West Point and came to the Pentagon and worked uh, in the office of the Secretary of Defense for Financial Management, uh, my senior raider, or my my senior boss there, was a guy by the name of uh, Joe Robles. He was a Brigadier General at the time. And Two and a half years later, three years later, um, he ends up at, uh, actually it was about five years later, he ends up being CEO at USAA. And as a result of that, and, you know, we, they have a process, the, the individual who was chairman at the time was actually looking at the board, and, you know, USAA is a uh, $30 billion plus organization. And as you mentioned before, we had uh, quite a few four stars from all of the services that were on it and uh, fantastic individuals. And they were responsible for the uh, birth as well as the growth of the organization over the years. However, as the chairman looked at everything, you know, we've got a, we've, at the time we had bank, we had real estate, we've got insurance. And it is a conglomerate that's a fortune, you know, 150, 175 company. And if you think about it, Certainly people from the military who spent their career there, they understand leadership, they understand strategy, but you get down to finance, and it's a pretty, you know, discreet expertise that you need. And this chairman was looking to get people who certainly had the military background, that's a requirement, however, that also understood finance and risk and all of these issues. And, you know, a very, very strenuous process, and somehow I was fortunate enough to be... um, uh, selected to join the board, uh, which I actually joined the board in 2010 uh, after going through all of the uh, process. I remember that because my son was playing football at West Point at the time. And uh, uh, did that, and I'm, I'm happy to report that this year I was uh, selected to be vice chair of that board. And, uh, you know, everything go right in a couple of years. I'll have the opportunity to lead that august and very, very uh, fine organization. So now, Herman, help our audience understand. So you are now leading this, uh, you're part of the leadership team of what, this is an amazing world-renowned organization. What does it actually look and feel like to be a board member of an organization like this? So some people probably imagine in the old days, like you'd walk into the room, you'd open up the papers when you got there, you put your foot up on the desk, you have a nice meeting, they give you a check on your way out. It's nothing like that. We, we talked about Sarbanes-Oxy before. The world has changed only partly because of that. 
um, the, the rigor, the quality, the frequency of which you're doing the work for this organization. Try to give us a sense of the scope around that. Well, anybody in financial services or even in um, um, uh, pharmaceuticals or whatever, where there's government regulatory guidelines to follow, it is tough business. And uh, it takes a lot of time to prepare. I tell people who are trying to get on board, you know, what you just explained in terms of, hey, you go, you have a couple hours, you go play golf, and then you go home, you grab your check. It is not like that. So the uh, preparation is uh, very, very intense. Uh, you're dealing with, first of all, it's such a pleasure. That board is, I got to tell you, it's one of my favorite boards because what you're doing People like yourself, Alexander, but what really gets me excited is, remember, I'm a former officer, and I remember those privates and specialists that you were working with, and knowing that you're helping them and their families, particularly uh, during the uh, the last 20 years we've been at war, so the families are back home, they've got to get their financials squared away, and the fact that you're doing something that is helping really gives you a sense of contribution and a, a good feeling. Now, I think this ties back almost magically to the point you made, Herman, earlier about how do you find a board? And part of that was, I'm going to say it was like, do you believe in the product? And it was sort of the opposite experience of like, well, I can't be behind the products of the tobacco companies. Whereas USA, um, I'm imagining you already drinking the Kool-Aid. You're probably already a longstanding member who'd use their products and probably market it just to people because you were so happy about it. So I think that partly builds in partly with the pleasure of being on the board. And I imagine m- most of us probably won't have that feeling with every board opportunity that comes to us. There's grades in between it. But that's sort of the Valhalla if it works out like, wow, this is great. So you've done that with your second board. Like you've, you fit with something that's just clearly clicks with you. How do you go from there when you think about, okay, I'm probably going to be want to be a portfolio board member, and you can probably be a bit choosy at this point. You've got this great public company board you're serving on. How do you then go about assessing all the various opportunities of how you might pursue using your time and your talents after that? Well, one of the things that I uh, have often said is, and even now, headhunting firms are very involved in the board selection process. Uh, and, and a lot of that is uh, risk management because you remember we went through the situation 20 years ago when people were fluffing their resumes and obviously the NOM and Governance Committee is being held accountable. You've got to do your due diligence. Uh, so the headhunting firms, they do a, a great job and they do a great purpose. I'm still convinced that 70% of board seats, maybe even 75, are, are, are primarily filled through that relationship process, Alexander, and you and I have been talking about for the last 30 minutes. So so with that, I think every board that I've served on, and I guess it's probably counting the nonprofits, uh, probably nine or ten, uh, somehow there's been a relationship there and not a cold call. And uh, uh, the, next, the, the next board uh, I was on was uh, Excellus, which is a spinoff of ITT, and it's their defense uh, contracting part. So obviously there's a, a, a good thing there and that, you know, I have been in the military, understand it, the defense sector. And by this time, I've established a pretty good reputation in real estate as well as marketing and operations. And uh, an individual who was CEO of that company was actually someone that I served in the Army with, uh, Dave Melcher. Um, who's just an outstanding individual. As a matter of fact, we taught together at, at West Point, and we, we overlapped a year at Harvard Business School. And as he was putting his board together for this, uh, you know, he could obviously recommend someone, but in the end, uh, you know, I had to uh, interview with other board members to include the chairman. And I'll never forget the chairman of the board. He said, hey, I understand you uh, you know Dave, and uh, you go Scott Baker well, so how do you see – uh, your ability to be here and be on the board. And I looked at him and just straight in the eye said, well, you know, Dave, certainly I respect and I know him, but when I'm in that boardroom, my responsibility is to the share, the stakeholders, which includes the shareholders, the employees, the communities in which we operate, uh, as well as the suppliers. And he just looked at me, he just looked at me straight and he said, Right answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think uh, those of us who, to some extent, become professional board members. I mean, there is a uh, a process to being a professional board member, and you've got to call it the way you see it, because you're in that room uh, with a orchestrated group of people uh, that have been put together 
to get the best outcome for all of those stakeholders that I mentioned. And most people just talk about the shareholders, but you got to think about all those stakeholders. And I agree with that. And we appreciate the Business Roundtable expanding it to beyond just the shareholders because it is it's the customers, the employees, the retirees, all these different groups of people. Now, Herman, you're using your expertise not just for for-profit entities, but also in, in some nonprofit ones. For example, also, again, name brands we'd recognize, like the American Red Cross. We are on the national board there. Um, tell us about how the nonprofit stuff fits in with your overall perspective of where you should be investing your time and your talents and how someone would go about looking for the nonprofit board, maybe that really tugs in their heart strings that they would love to be, be a part of? I think it's so important, and uh, I often say uh, that everybody knows to whom much is given, much is expected. And I think as you go out and put your portfolio of boards together, uh, it shouldn't be all about your receiving. And, uh, you know, look, let's face it, you're on a great corporate board. Uh, there's some ego involved there, and, you know, probably every once in a while you're going to get on a corporate jet and you're going to do all these things, and you can't let that consume you. And uh, what I tried to teach my kids, who I'm proud to say with my wife's assistance have been very, very successful, is that you should also give back. And I use the same criteria when you ask yourself, what is something that you really, really feel strongly about that you can identify with? And, of course, the first one I talked about was the West Point Association of Graduates, of which I've been uh, – you know, involved in for over 20 years and just uh, feel strongly about West Point. And then I I, I was recruited uh, to be on the American Red Cross board. And at the time, uh, I was running a business unit uh, at JLL. And obviously, you don't have a lot of time when you're doing that. And um, uh, Gail, the CEO over there, she is just a, uh, she's a stickler. She knows how to how to how to get you and you know this dance went on for probably six to nine months uh, trying to cultivate me and then in the end as I learned more about the organization and how important it is and then you again you look at you know uh, the uh, uh, other board members are you know CEOs practically of uh, major organizations and I told her they used to have like 45 board members they restructured it and now we have wow. 12. I told her I would not have gone on her board with 45 board members because not much gets done when you've got to talk to 45 people. But we restructured, and again, there are 12 of us, I think, 12 or 14, and it's a great group of people. And I go back to what I said before. Am I learning? Oh, my gosh, am I learning? Uh, do I have an opportunity? Um, I helped them set up their risk uh, committee because I chaired the risk committee and stood it up at USAA, so I had some, some expertise there. Real estate. They do a lot of things with real estate, so I was able to provide some input there. Then I was able to learn you know, from the people who do the investment management, for example. And uh, you cannot quarrel whatsoever with the mission of the American Red Cross. Right. And uh, you just get a great feeling. And, and one other uh, board, I serve 10, I'm actually emeritus on it, another nonprofit. Uh, I also played football at one point, and I'm a you know, uh, a, a weekend jock, uh, but now it's mostly golf, but still have that competitive spirit. And uh, one of my mentors got me involved in the military bowl board, uh, which is a NCAA sanctioned football game that's held here in the Washington DC area every year. And that's just been a lot of fun because I still, you know, get to hang out with, uh, you know, football teams. I've welcomed the teams a couple of times, and you're talking to those young men, and you can remember, of course, at West Point, we didn't go to bowl games back in the 70s. Uh, however, as I do welcoming speeches, talking to them, you know, you want to keep it uh, a little lively. You don't want to make it seem like an economics uh, lecture, but at the same time telling them that this is a great time in their life. However, they need to understand how athletics can be a means to an end, and that's the way I used athletics in my life. So I, I really enjoyed uh, doing that actively for 10 years, and as I said, I'm an emeritus board member now. And I think people could probably look at both of these two, so the Military Bowl and certainly the American Red Cross, and there are probably some people listening to the show, Herman, that view nonprofits as a way perhaps to gain the experience so that someone can see that they're ready to be in the board, but potentially also for networking as well. Like if you pulled up the American Red Cross board, it's sort of the who's who, and you go, well, those are amazing people, and if they see me doing my best work, it might just naturally, sort of the way you've told stories, down the line open some doors for me. And I don't think that's a bad thing, right? I think there's a lot of reasons people do board work. What are your thoughts around that? No, no. I, look, look, 
I want to be very uh, clear here, and I'll be very transparent. Um, you know, part of things I do as a senior leader at uh, JLL is, you know, I'm responsible. You know, senior people, I've got a saying, you're either a grinder, a minder, or a finder. And the more senior you are, uh, the more you need to be putting uh, fuel on the fire, so to speak, in terms of helping drive business. And uh, I, I, I very seldom ask any of my compatriots who are on these boards with me for business. Every once in a while, maybe somebody in the firm is working on something and I say, hey, I'm trying to get something and I need to get into the firm. And obviously, I'm either working with a you know, CFO, CEO, whomever, and it's easy to, to make a call. However, what I've done, Alexander, over the years is I am myself in the boardroom and the expertise that you have over time comes out. And I would say of the deals and things that I do with JLL, probably 50 to 60% of them mm. result from somebody calling me and saying, hey, Herman, I've got this real estate issue, and I wish you would, uh, you know, what, what do you think about it? And at this point, they're a colleague, they're a friend, they trust you. And uh, as I follow up with them and the teams at JLL know that, you know, if Herman brought you this deal, you got to make sure that – you are on it full time, and I don't just take it and then hand it off to somebody and say good luck. You know, I'm going to monitor it and make sure it happens because that becomes part of your brand, right? What you do, what you say, what you represent, and uh, generally speaking, when I say something's going to happen, I'm going to do everything within my influence to make it happen. So there is a um, uh, uh, externally in terms of a benefit from being around these very, very successful people and have an opportunity to, you know, I won't say show who you are, but they understand who you are as a result of you being yourself. That makes a lot of sense. And, and Herman, as I try to think of how to bring some of this together, right, you've got this amazing decade plus of experience sitting on multiple boards. And let's just say the board world has changed dramatically during that time and maybe even never faster than the last year and a half, two years from what we've seen, partly because of COVID, right? So supply chain issues, HR issues, we can go on and on and on. COVID. I hate to interrupt you, but, uh, you know, the racism issue right, right. Uh, has really changed boardrooms over the last 24, right. 36 months. And, and, we, and even before that, we were seeing a build of awareness that diversity was important. And I think gender was where it really started. And, and the racism, the other stuff, and I think there's just a recognition. We talked about in USA, they understand that you need the veteran perspective, right? And maybe disabled vet. Like, there's all sorts of different categories that we need lots of different perspectives in the boardroom to be successful. That is not going away. And when you look to the future of the boardroom, how do you think we're going to start to get to more of a, a better place on some of these terrible, hard topics that we really need to solve that there's not easy answers to? Well, I was um, giving a speech last week in Park City, Utah. And as I looked at the audiences with the uh, National Association of Corporate Directors, I give speeches all around the country for and with them. And I looked into the audience. So I'm in, uh, I'm in Utah. And there were, um, if your audience doesn't know by now, I'm a black male. And as I looked in the audience, there were, out of 600 people, there were two other black males in the audience. And I was, uh, my, my, my conversation was on ESG, and I mm -hmm. certainly covered the environmental, the social, as well as the governance. And when we got to the social and the governance part of it, um, I challenged the audience. And these were people who are on boards, you know, aspiring to be on boards, as well as senior management of uh, really companies throughout the uh, Mountain West area there. And, and I, I have a um, hypothesis that people sometimes think that diversity, whether it's gender or ethnicity, is a feel-good thing to do. And what I uh, propose and I um, – dictate, or I should say, express in the boardroom is that diversity is a business issue. It's a business imperative. And if you look at the census data now, the last census data that came out, of the people under 18 uh, in America, the majority of people are non-white. So people of color under the age of 18 represent over 50% of the populace. And if you extend that somewhere between 2035 and 2045, depending on how these birth rates go, uh, you're going to have, in America, the majority of people are going to be of color. Now, there are all kinds of political implications and things that have happened over the last few years uh, where people are trying to prevent that from happening, but uh, I think it's sort of like water. 
it's going to find its low point, and um, uh, this is going to happen. And if you think about that from a board perspective, you ask yourself the following questions. Uh, who is going to make my products? So we've got a war for talent right now. Uh, I'm discussing that in every boardroom I'm in right now. Who is going to sell my product? And who is going to buy my product? And if you look at that, and I'm seeing right now, for example, a lot of things I work with on my day job at JLL, the clients are asking for and demanding that the teams be diverse, that service the account, and don't tell me what I am. You need to be diverse to help me reach my aspirational goals. And that is becoming important. So the point I'm making is what becomes important now, it's a business decision. And, uh, you know, most of the boards that I'm on and the ones that aren't, we're looking at it, uh, holding management accountable for diversity and making it, you know, sometimes, you know, it started 10 years ago, it was one-tenth of 1%, one and, you know, somebody would say, well, you know, I can, I can get over that, I'll just go do one more deal. But it's got to be done in a meaningful way that it reinforces and establishes a culture of inclusiveness which results in your long-term sustainability as an organization. And as we've just discussed, that is in the best interest of the stakeholders, all the shareholders, the employees, the customers, the community, everybody else. So, Herman, thank you for sharing how you have broken barriers, how you have set standards, how you're continuing to push to do that. It was a delight hearing about your successful career on multiple levels, such as the value that our military people bring into the boardroom, that the minorities that we just talked about, the value that they bring into our boardroom. And I'm sure you're going to have continued success beyond this. You just talked about turning down another board opportunity today. So we were delighted to have you on the show. Thank you for sharing your insights and helping all of us to be boardroom bound. Yeah. And, and one other thing I can tell you, uh, my most recent board that I joined, uh, I thought about it for a while while my wife was going through her uh, challenge with uh, cancer. And then after she passed, I decided that I would do it. And it started with them wanting to just have me be on the board. And it's a company called Fluence, which is a joint venture between AES, you know, international utility company, and Siemens, a multi-hundred billion dollar company headquartered in Germany. And in the end, they said, well, you know, I was, I don't know if I can do this. I've had time, et cetera, et cetera. And then they said, well, not only we want you to be on the board, we want you to be chairman of the board. And I'm happy to say that approximately three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we ring the bell on NASDAQ or Fluence, F-L-N-C is the uh, ticker for it. And it is uh, now a public company. And uh, yours truly, I have the pleasure of um, – being chairman of the board of public company, which is a phenomenal responsibility. I feel honored by it. Uh, you know, the, the, the chair of that role is uh, a, little, a little different than just being a, a board member. I tell people to be a good board member, what you need to be able to do is ask good questions. It's not about you having the answers to good questions. Uh, being chair of the board, it's monitoring mm -hmm. and making sure those questions are answered at the same time, herding the cats, making sure that everyone, because remember, everyone's on that board for a purpose, that you get their idea, you get their perspective, and then at the same time, making sure that that relationship with management does not become antagonistic and keeping it at the same time, you've got constructive challenge to make sure you can do the best thing in the interest of all the uh, stakeholders we discussed. Well, congratulations, and I can see USA is in good hands as the future board chair there. That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound. I really enjoyed chatting with Herman Bowles. Amazing background and experience in the board world. It doesn't seem to be anything that he hasn't done and great lessons for all of us about how we need to build that reputation as also in the networking, combining the two of those will be how the opportunities come about. Now remember, if you head over to podcast.gordon.edu, you will find links to all of today's resources. And please know that the Boardroom Bound team and I are so proud to be your go-to podcast. For all things that connect, prepare, and empower you to land a board team. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and with any of the high-quality content we're bringing to every Wednesday. Thanks for joining me today. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. Remember to keep tuning in to the Boardroom Bound.